We must now move to questions for the Minister for Social Development, and I call Mr. Michael Majemsey. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and I thank the, the member for his question. You'll recall that the sites were originally vested back in 2008 for social, social and affordable housing, and since then, uh, 136 new social houses have been delivered. Unfortunately, the provision of affordable housing in the current housing market is not uh, the viable option for the housing associations. The Housing Executive is undertaking an economic appraisal looking at the range of options for redeveloping the vacant land for residential housing and a completed economic appraisal is expected to be submitted to the Housing Executive Board for approval before the end of this financial year. <coughs> uh, uh, can I thank uh, the Minister for that answer and yes I recall his uh, visit. Uh, uh, to the village, but, and he's aware of large areas of land vacant in the village area, as indeed there is at Hope Street, Wellwood Street and Sandy Row, and at Posnet Street in Donegal Pass. So we have those three communities with land sitting, waiting for social housing. There is the need uh, and there is the demand, uh, and we're looking for some sort of uh, uh, date, or a, 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 a notional date at least, when we can come to a, a decision. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think and I share the members' frustration, having come in to post and having visited the area. And, and I think that the point that has been made to me by a number of political representatives from the area is that what was taken away, uh, now in terms of the quality of what has been replaced, is certainly something which is uh, to be welcomed. However, the issue is quantity. The issue is the number. And to have only the 136 put in place gives us the, the challenge that there still remains to ensure that we see development in that area. My objective uh, since being in post has been about trying to ensure that we deliver good quality homes. But I think that we have, to, we have to add in addition to that not only the issue of quality but we have to add the issue of quantity. And it does raise a point that while I can come to this house and say that we, over the programme for government target period, we have met that target. I think that when you look at areas such as South Belfast, uh, members are right to raise the question about the number of properties. And so, therefore, the information or the economic appraisal that's uh, expected to be submitted to the Housing Executive Board for approval will form a part of that. And I trust that that will be uh, finalised for the Board by the end of this financial year. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Um, the Minister referred to the number of de demolitions. In fact, there were 539 demolitions. And to hear that there, were, there have only been 136 replacements is quite discouraging, given that they were in the latter part of the 10-year programme. Uh, there was originally a commitment to build 273 new houses in addition to refurbishments. Has that 273 commitment now been abandoned, or is that going to be kept? I don't think that we're in the case of trying to abandon any commitments that were made in relation to the placement. What we are in the business of trying to is identify how and when the replacements will be put in place and we can actually get further progress. Just to have, uh, and the member is right in terms of, and, and that's why in response to the initial question by uh, the, the member for the area, I said that the 136 is not enough. It's not just the issue of the quality. It is an issue of the quantity. And I want to see over the next uh, period of time, uh, I'm certainly keen to review uh, why it has been that there has been a delay and when it is that we are going to say, yes, economic appraisal will go to the uh, Housing Executives Board by, uh, before the end of this financial year. But we need clarity, we need certainty, and I repeat, We'd still need to have quantity. Ms. Rosie McCorley. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, Keshta Dolidahal. Question two, please. Thank the member for her uh, question. The final tenant participation strategy for Northern Ireland. 2015-2020 uh, will be published later this month. 
along with an action plan. My officials will be working with stakeholders to ensure the elements of the strategy is implemented. This will include the introduction of a new consumer standard to the regulatory framework for social housing providers, which will put tenants at the centre of the process. Other elements of the strategy will include the development of guidance for landlords and tenant groups and support for an independent tenant organisation. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for his answer. And can I ask uh, the Minister, would he perceive any, any delay in the implementation of the strategy? No, I, I think that the difficulty that I think all ministers face is ensuring how that we don't uh, bring about unnecessary delay. And obviously, when we have the publication of the action plan, it would be my intention to ensure that we move forward in a way which is uh, in the spirit of what has been set out, in the way which we can actually see what has been said we want to achieve actually delivered. So I don't intend that there would be delay. However, I can't be definitive because, uh, as in all of these things, there can sometimes be uh, issues that are raised that have to be dealt with at the time that can become somewhat of a distraction. But as far as I am concerned as Minister and the Department is concerned, working in, con uh, in conjunction with others, we will keep a focus on implementing what we've said we want to achieve. Mr. David Hildage. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the Minister tell us, as part of the overall social housing reform programme, uh, will the current housing executive stock transfer out of public ownership? I thank the member for his question. And in relation to that issue, the options for structural reform have been identified and assessed, but this work is being revisited in the light of the executive's fresh start commitment to progressing structural reform in social housing delivery in a manner that focuses on re reducing Dell subsidy pressures, and the member will be well aware of what they are, and that remains the trajectory in terms of where we want to go with this particular issue. Well, Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I ask the Minister, in relation to the tenant participation strategy, how inclusive will it be, given that there are more and more uh, tenants who are uh, the tenants of private landlords, uh, and sometimes on an individual uh, basis. So, how will their views be uh, captured in, in, in the strategy? And I thank the member uh, for her question, and also for her interest in this issue, because it is an issue that she has raised with me on a number of occasions. And, and she raises a valid point in terms of, of the private rented sector. Uh, the strategy is focused on tenant participation for tenants in social housing. My officials have published a discussion document on the review of the role of the regulation of the private rented sector. And the aim of the review is to consider the current and potential future role of the sector and, across, and assess the effectiveness of current regulation, identifying where improvements can be made to help make the private rented sector a more attractive uh, housing op option. This consultation opened uh, on the 12th of November 2015 and closes on the 5th of February 2016. <coughs> well, Mr. Patsy McGlow. Question number three, please. Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, the number of people accepted as statutorily homeless over the last five years has, in fact, been fairly steady, with a small decrease of 3% in numbers between 2010 and 2015. Homelessness has been at the top of my list of priorities since I came into office. And over the past month, I have visited many hostels and facilities and learned at first hand of the experiences of a number of vulnerable and marginalized individuals in our society. While the decrease in homelessness figures is quite small, it is a step in the right direction and we are in a far better place than many other regions. My department will provide funding this year of over £35 million for homelessness services. This funding includes help for those in emergency situations, funding for work to prevent homelessness and provide appropriate advice, as well as housing support related support services through Supporting People programme. While I'm satisfied 
that the work we do does make a positive impact uh, to the lives of many. I know that there is no room for complacency. Homelessness is a complex issue that requires a number of organisations to continue to work together to tackle it. And I want to pay tribute uh, in conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, in relation to this issue to those many organisations who continue, and particularly over the Christmas period, who have tirelessly worked to ensure that we make available the best possible provision that we can to address what is a very challenging and a very difficult issue in our society. Mr McLoan for supplementary. Um, I thank the Minister for his response and I too would concur with his sentiments around those organisations and people, many of whom give of their time voluntarily to support people often on our streets and uh, try and pull things back together for them in their difficult traumatic times. Um, to, to bring it back to the issue of the homelessness then, um, I'm sure the Minister, being a grassroots constituency worker himself, would acknowledge this, that a lot of the pressure around homelessness had previously gone over to the private sector to try and uh, provide homes for people. That appears from my own experience in my own constituency, the private sector is being by and large eaten up and taken by tenants. So therefore the question comes back then, the public sector and maybe the social housing sector to refer to it more specifically, uh, does the Minister feel that the that has provided question. And, uh, just, <laughs> does the Minister feel that, that has provided an adequate response to the need and meeting that need? I think we're always challenged in government as to whether or not we have provided adequately in, in any set of circumstances. We have to in many times respond on the basis of what is available, what the resources uh, we ha that we have. However, when we come to deal with this issue, I think that we have to try and stretch ourselves given the nature, and I think sometimes given uh, what is a misunderstanding around uh, the, the definitions of homelessness, and, uh, and we, we could touch on that, but I want, to, I want to deal particularly with the issue that the member raises in relation to the private rented sector and have, how have they sought to address that particular issue uh, and meet uh, housing need. The member will be well aware that the private rented sector uh, access scheme uh, operated by Smartmove seeks to assist the more vulnerable with a rent deposit guarantee and other housing management issues. The introduction of the landlord registration and tenancy deposit schemes has made the private rented sector a more attractive uh, housing option. Tenants and prospective tenants can check if their landlord is complying with the law or report them to their council for enforcement action. My department has recently launched a discussion paper on the review of the role and regulation of the private rented sector, which seeks to make the private rented sector more viable, more attractive as a housing option. And the closing date for that particular uh, issue uh, responses is the 5th of February 2016. Well, Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And the Minister's response to the earlier question, he mentioned um, about statutory homeless. Could the Minister outline what that term actually means in Northern Ireland? Uh, thank you, Member, for, for his question. And I again welcome the opportunity to, to place on record and to place in the public domain what do we mean when we deal with the term statutory homeless? What does it really mean? And, you know, we can sometimes use these phrases and, and they mask reality and they mask what is, is going on out there in terms of our communities. But the Northern Ireland Housing Executive has a statutory responsibility for responding to the issue of homelessness. And to be accepted as statutorily homeless under the scheme, a number of factors are taken into account as set out in the Housing Northern Ireland Order 1988. Applicants accepted as statutorily homeless either have accommodation that is deemed inappropriate or no accommodation available to them. Homelessness, as I've said to the previous question asked by Mr Midlone, is a complex issue that is often characterised as being solely all about rough sleeping when this is not the full picture. Homelessness figures also include people who are living in temporary accommodation or those living in inappropriate or overcrowded accommodation. 
It also includes those who are threatened with homelessness, such as people who face eviction from their homes. Mr. William Irwin. Question number four, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for uh, his question. And I firmly believe that our town and city centre play an important role in driving competitiveness and economic growth. Over the past 10 years, my department has, uh, working with a range of stakeholders, sought to improve the viability and validity of our centre and town centres and has invested in excess of 83 million in more than 78 public realm schemes across Northern Ireland. My department has funded numerous public realm improvement schemes in town, city, town and city centres over the past 10 years, ranging from the 28 million Belfast Streets Ahead Phase 1 project to more modest schemes such as the 225,000 scheme in Dromore County Down. In addition, DSD has also delivered over 60 restore revitalisation projects in town and cities across Northern Ireland through an investment in excess of 8 million, largely focusing on physical enhancements to shop fronts to help promote town centres and the independent retail sector uh, primarily. My department has also invested 10 million over the last five years to support our city centres within the Newry and Armagh constituency and uses a range of regeneration measures to achieve this purpose. These include comprehensive development, public realm improvements, revitalisation projects and urban uh, development grants. And I think that it is well accepted that the economic benefits include job creation, creating new business opportunities and facilitating or stimulating the private sector in investment. Mr Irvine for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for his uh, response. Can the Minister tell us uh, what has DSD, DSD spent in relation to town centre regeneration in Amma City Centre? Well, I suppose and how often have we come to this house and said it all politics is local and given the fight in the year that we are in, uh, 2016, uh, I suspect that we as Ministers will be asked this question uh, more directly and more pointedly over the next number of weeks. And I can uh, inform the member that in the past five years, my department has invested approximately 5.3 million in support of city centre development in uh, Armagh City. This include, included approximately four million pounds towards the public realm improvements throughout the city centre and 92,000 pounds towards the creation of a master plan to shape uh, future development within the area. 431,000 towards the revitalisation schemes to sustain the city's vibrancy, uh, 400,000 towards the purchase of a development site to invigorate an important area of the city centre at uh, Mal West, and 265,000 by way of urban uh, development grant to assist with uh, city centre investments. And I think that adds to a considerable commitment on the part of my department. Uh, working in conjunction, I have to say, with the local uh, authority to enhance and to improve the uh, aesthetics and the way in which the city of Armagh continues to be a place where people want to visit and a place where the local residents and the rest of Northern Ireland can be rightly proud. And I pay tribute to all those who have helped us to achieve that. And I have seen from my own uh, visits to the city and to other places across Northern Ireland over the last year, even though sometimes a small amount of money is invested, the impact and the benefit that that can bring, and I have no doubt my budget uh, is under uh, considerable pressure, but I look forward to working with our colleagues in local government as we roll out the schemes for the next financial year. Call Mr John Dalit. Uh, question number five. Uh, thank the member for uh, his question. And can I just say uh, in answer, uh, before I answer, that uh, I want to wish, now we probably will have, we may have the opportunity before the end of this mandate, but just in case we don't, because it can be the ballot process sometimes can mean that a member is not selected, but I want to thank uh, the member for uh, his contribution to this assembly. He will be amiss 
uh, to, I know, his own party in terms of his presence and also to the uh, very distinctive way that he has of uh, ensuring that he gets his point made. And I have no doubt today will be no different, but I wish him well in the future. Uh, and I wouldn't want other events that have taken place in this chamber today uh, to overshadow the fact that I want to, on a personal basis, say uh, the best wishes to Mr Dallet. Now to the answer, what he's looking for, which is more important. And following my statement <coughs> to the Assembly on the 26th of November, the member will be aware of my decision not to proceed with the regeneration bill, with the result that my department will continue to have operational responsibility for the delivery of urban regeneration and community development services across Northern Ireland. Organisations currently delivering services to the neighbourhood renewal areas have been written to advising them of the current position. As you are aware, the Executive is again facing significant financial pressures which are likely to result in the reduction of my department's budget. These budget reductions will further limit the amount of funding that will be available through the programmes that my department currently delivers. Therefore, I cannot at this stage give any commitment that any projects or programmes currently funded by my department will continue at its current level, if indeed at all, from the 1st of April 2016. However, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, I am aware of the excellent relationships that have been built up between councils and departmental officials through the transition planning process. And despite the delay in extending the regeneration powers to Council, I anticipate we will, continue, we will all continue to work together on delivering ask, key services for citizens of Northern Ireland. Mr Dallet for a supplementary. The minister's remarks that I'm almost incapable of asking a supplementary. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it, at, at least I'm glad that it, it caused great amusement to Lord Morrow on the benches opposite. Uh, they, I think the Minister quite rightly acknowledges that the Neighbourhood Renewal Scheme has been of enormous benefit, particularly in towns like Coleraine that needed precisely that type of investment. I am sorry that he has had to indicate that the budget has to be reduced. Can I confirm that? the uh, responsibility will transfer to the Department of Communities and can I give the Assembly some indication of what the reduction will be? Well, obviously, yes, I can confirm the decision to transfer the regeneration and community development powers to local government ultimately rests with the Executive and the new Department for the Communities, DFC, will have a much wider range of responsibilities. In this context, it would be prudent to wait until the new functions have been assimilated in the DFC, and then the executive can determine when any of those responsibilities would be best delivered at a local level. But I can say to the, to the member that I do face a considerable challenge around the issue of six, uh, five to six percent of a reduction in my budget. It will be a challenge. However, when I come in to office, uh, the member may recall that I faced the same situation, particularly around neighbourhood renewal, and I endeavoured, working extensively with uh, NICFA, with the community and voluntary sector, uh, we were able to see a considerable progress made that the outcome wasn't as bad as it had been originally envisaged. I unfortunately am in the same position, and I've had to uh, ensure that I prioritise in terms of my budget. I have given commitments, and I publicly do it again today, to issues such as supporting people. I think that's the right thing to do. But in terms of neighbourhood renewal, in terms of working with the local councils, that is a give, and I will continue to discuss with them. Indeed, uh, before the end of uh, February, I hope to have again met all the local authorities, had discussions with them, because obviously they have concerns around the uh, pause in the uh, transfer of functions. But as I have been committed in 2015 to this issue, I remain committed in 2016 as long as I am in this post. Well, Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Will the Minister confirm to the House that the spend across the local council area will reflect what was anticipated to transfer to each council under the reform of the local government? 
I thank the member for, for his question. And councils have been advised of all the budgets anticipated to transfer to them should the uh, Regeneration Bill have successfully completed its legislative passage. However, as this is no longer the case, there will be no specific allocation to councils to deliver services to tackle the deprivation. In 1617, the responsibility remains within my department. However, I rehearse uh, what I said to <coughs> the member, and that is that I will, over the next number of weeks, continue to have discussions uh, with the local authorities so that I can go some way in trying to alleviate their concerns. And I, I'm, I'm not uh, naive to recognise that there are concerns, and there is a mixture of disappointment and, in some cases, relief, uh, because there are some local authorities who believe that because of the other challenges that they face uh, in terms of they've just been established and they have considerable challenges around the new powers that they already have, that this, is, this pose may be uh, advantageous. It is my duty and my responsibility to work with them to ensure that we don't lose out uh, as in a way that uh, is detrimental to projects such as the, the member referred to through neighbourhood renewal. That's my commitment and that's a challenge that I have in the next number of weeks. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how he will ensure sustainable funding for the Women's Centre Child Care Fund for 15-16, given uh, his joint neighbourhood renewal funding bid was not accepted by the Minister for Finance and Personnel? Uh, I thank the member for that question, and he's absolutely right. And I think it needs to be remembered in terms of that fund, uh, it was my department that stepped in and over the last number of years have given uh, funding in uh, a way which has ensured the continued delivery. I, I remain committed to that uh, particular position. I did indicate that uh, last year, in terms of the budget process, that this would be the last year. However, given the fact that uh, we have an OFM, DFM childcare strategy, which uh, won't come into operation until uh, 2017, there is this issue of what we do in the interim. And I can give the member this assurance that that is an issue that uh, I am being particularly exercised at the moment about. There are other members in the House who have written to me in relation to it. It impinges on a number uh, of constituencies, and I am well aware of the issue in relation to his own constituency in East Belfast and other places. And for me, it is a focus. It still remains a priority, and I have to uh, work uh, now with the new First Minister uh, and ensure that uh, we have a transition which is uh, as best as we possibly can, not, detriment, not detrimental to the delivery of the service. Mr. Roy Beggs. Mr. Speaker, uh, the small pockets of deprivation uh, funding was created to avoid uh, discrepancy from and prevent inequalities under neighbourhood renewal uh, guidance because of the minimum threshold. Would the minister uh, assure me? that small pockets of deprivation funding will continue to support those communities that would have qualified under neighbourhood renewal but for the threshold? Member for his question, what, what I think I can give the assurance is that we value the work that uh, SPODs did in terms of uh, the contribution that they made. I do face a particular uh, challenge in relation to the budget. That is now, as with the neighbourhood renewal, as with regards to the other funds, the supporting people, and all of those things, decisions that I have to make. But I can give this assurance to the member that the good work that was accomplished uh, by uh, that, and, and again, in some cases, not a huge amount of money, uh, but to those particular communities, and this is always the issue that we face in this House. There are some members who are just always very critical of spending uh, that amount of money because uh, it may not suit them politically to actually have to say that there are certain elements in, in our societies that do need that help, that do need that assistance. 
And I know that I'm not referring to the member in terms of this issue, but uh, it is uh, an issue that continues to be under consideration. That's the only uh, comfort that I can give to him. There may be a clearer picture uh, by the end of next week or the beginning of the following week when we have a settled budget position. But at the moment, the next number of days are particularly challenging for me to ensure that I know exactly what the final line of my budget is going to be. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I, I, I noted earlier the Minister's provision of £35 million toward the homeless, which I, I certainly welcome. Uh, will he advise how uh, our welcome guests from Syria uh, are settling into their homes as refugees, uh, and uh, are their needs being addressed satisfactorily? And have they any specific requirements which has come to his attention? Well, I thank the, the member for his question. Obviously, uh, the issue of the uh, Syrian refugees that arrived in Northern Ireland was a very uh, interesting topic of discussion uh, prior to uh, Christmas. And I can confirm to the member that a group of 51 Syrian refugees arrived in Northern Ireland on the 15th of December past. I'm happy to report that the plans which we put in place worked very effectively. Uh, the arrangements at the airport worked extremely well, and the refugees were taken through the necessary processes and transferred to the Welcome Centre without any uh, uh, incident. The refugees stayed at the Welcome Centre in Belfast for three nights, and during that time they were helped through uh, and provided with uh, essential uh, information and help that we believed was important for them to have. And I'm able to tell the House today that one uh, of the interpreters who assisted us at the Welcome Centre said that he had worked at several similar locations uh, other, in other parts of the United Kingdom, and the quality of response in Northern Ireland was by some distance the best that had been seen. On the Friday after their arrival, all the refugees' families had been successfully settled into their new accommodation. And I had the privilege of meeting with the refugees' families while they were at the Welcome Centre, and it was clear that they all were very grateful for the kindness and the support that had been shown to them by the people of Northern Ireland. I want to conclude by saying this. I do want to place on record my sincere appreciation to those other organisations that have helped us during this process. It was an example of what can be done when there is a particular need that is presented to us here in Northern Ireland. Mr McNary for supplement. It is very pleasing and gratifying to hear the, the, the answer from the Minister so far. Will, will he say if he has had any reports of discontentment by locals uh, which had, would have a bearing on uh, those already here, and particularly those uh, coming in the next tranche of refugees when they arrive, and in which case would he join with me uh, in repudiating those who act with racial prejudice? Thank the, the member. I do thank the member genuinely for the comments that he makes, and, and I know that, that he uh, has raised legitimate issues in terms of uh, benefit, in terms of many other things. But he has done it in a way which has not been uh, akin to some of the other very negative uh, and, I have to say, deplorable comments that have been made uh, by some, and some uh, have been uh, attributed to uh, those who are political representatives. And I think that is unfortunate and that is shameful. Uh, I am not aware, and, and if the member has any particular uh, issue that he may be aware of in terms of concerns, uh, I have also had discussions with the police. Uh, I have ongoing discussions with uh, my colleagues, obviously, in the department, the Red Cross, uh, and others who have been involved. But can I also, just to give him, in terms of, because he did mention this about you know, the possibility of the next number of, of refugees that would come. The next group to arrive in Northern Ireland will come as part of the second wave of Syrian refugees to come to the United Kingdom under the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme. The timing of that is not yet known. And our understanding is that uh, our national government wishes to review the arrangements put in place for the first wave of a thou the 1,000 Syrian refugees who arrived just before Christmas to learn the lessons for future groups and the timing of the arrival of future groups will follow that particular <coughs> review. So there is no, at this minute in time, no definitive date. But 
as I have said in the answer to the first part of the member's question, I am very satisfied and indeed very pleased with the huge amount of effort and goodwill that was shown. It is an example that I think we can use. Are there lessons to learn? Yes, I'm sure there are. We are currently looking at what those may be, and I would be quite happy to inform the member when we have come to a definitive answer on those issues. Can I remind the Minister of the two-minute rule? Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask um, the Minister what discussion he, he or his department have had with Professor Eileen Avison regarding the overall amount of money available for welfare reform mitigation now that the Chancellor has announced that tax credits will not be reformed? I thank the member for her uh, uh, question and I wish her well in her recovery. Uh, the uh, issue in relation to the, that she raises, maybe I could set it in some context. The Fresh Start Agreement set out the total amount of money which the Executive agreed could be available to mitigate the impact of the welfare reform and the Chancellor's announcement on tax credits in July 2015. The total amount of money was the $585 million. 75 million of this was to be made available in 1617, with 150 million in each of the following years for welfare. The executive proposed 60 million on tax credits in each of the four years covered by the Fresh Start Agreement. The Chancellor's decision not to proceed with the changes to tax credits clearly altered the position with the need for mitigating measures which were uh, not happening. In 1617, and this is an important point, uh, the Executive is proposing to allocate the £75 million for mitigating measures to address the impact all of the welfare changes. In addition, the Minister for Finance announced in the Assembly in December of 2015 that £30 million of the monies previously intended for the tax credit changes would be held in the reserve to address the recommendations within Professor Everson's working group. At this time, the Executive is waiting uh, Professor Everson to complete her work, and we look forward to giving her report the proper consideration that it deserves. Ms. Cochrane for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I couldn't quite hear uh, the Minister's full response due to talking just to, to my right. So, um, if I'm right in thinking, some of the money um, has been uh, set aside um, for the outcome of the report. Um, does that mean that the Minister uh, will perhaps um, think that that money could be used um, on other schemes such as job creation and skills development rather than just payment on uh, welfare reform mitigation? Well, obviously, this is an issue for the executive, and, and when we have receipt of the report and when we have worked uh, our way through that, then uh, the executive will be in a place to come to a definitive conclusion. Uh, I think we have made uh, progress in terms of dealing with what was in 2000. And 15, a very difficult situation. None of us wanted to be in the place where we were in relation to dealing with the issue of welfare. And we wanted, uh, and the member knows well the history of all of this. Uh, we started the year uh, back almost a year, well, a year ago, uh, in terms of trying to have a good news story about what came out of Stormont House and the Stormont Agreement. That unfortunately then had its challenges. However, we have ended 15 in a different place, and I want to ensure that what we do as we move forward in conjunction with my executive colleagues is in the spirit of what had been agreed and can still deliver for those uh, communities and those families who do have challenges when it comes to accessing our welfare system. I call Mr. Edwin Poots. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Given the importance that the Minister has previously recognised that he attaches to social enterprise and social economy, how does he see uh, us going forward uh, in supporting those schemes, uh, given the financial constraints that have been imposed upon us as, as, as a result of austerity? I thank the, the member for his, his question. And, and I know the member takes a particular interest in this in relation to the work that's done in his own constituency uh, through a number of organisations, but particularly uh, one that comes to mind is, is the Surgeon Trust. And Innovation NI, the Northern Ireland Executive's innovation strategy, aims to deliver a vision for Northern Ireland by 2025, uh, and it will be recognised as an innovation hub 
and will be one of the UK's leading high-growth knowledge-based regions which embraces creativity and innovation at all levels of society. The strategy also recognises the importance of social innovation, new ways of doing things, or altogether new things that deliver social benefit. And I concur with the comments of the, the member. It is an important issue. Sometimes there are those who would be dismissive of, of uh, having such a strategy. I don't think that that is the case. I think it is something that we need to continue to improve on and build upon. And my department chairs a social innovation working group, and its aim is, a, is an initial, in its initial phase is to bring together the key policymakers and practitioners to identify areas where social innovation could make a difference and scope out the areas of activity that they would want to continue to work in. Well, Mr. Pooch, for yes. a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy. I welcome the fact that Northern Ireland will uh, be a leader in, in social innovation. And I take it, therefore, that we will be able to provide um, support for innovation in the social economy sector uh, to ensure that we can have that sustainability uh, that m many groups require, uh, but that where public funding is going to be a challenge to achieve that. Yes, and I, and I think the other area which would be useful to, to place on record is, of course, uh, my department supporting the Young Foundation in some uh, social uh, pilot innovation work to support people across the communities and sectors to come together to create the social innovations needed to deliver uh, that particular change and through a co-creation process they will identify scope and prioritize because equally uh, while this is an issue for uh, it's not a generational issue. There is a focus that we still need to have, and it was mentioned earlier by the First Minister when she took up office, and that is about our young people. It's about giving our young people that sense of hope. It's giving our young people that sense of place. And I think that these initiatives uh, are a means. They're not the, the ultimate uh, end, uh, end place where we want all to be, but they are a means of seeking to achieve benefit and progress. <clears throat> Mr. Declan McAleer. Very well, good last, Ken uh, Can the Minister provide an update on the Community Asset Transfer Scheme? Thank the member for uh, his, his question. And, and he makes reference to an issue which I think is, uh, for me, has been an, an area of concern. I have to say I have been disappointed uh, at the way in which uh, the uh, modalities of the asset community uh, transfer process has worked. And I've had a number of occasions to be concerned about the way in which it didn't work. And I've had discussions with some of his colleagues uh, in relation to particular areas where there has been issues raised. I currently am doing a, a review of the issue of community asset transfer because I believe that it needs to be uh, more proactive. I think. Uh, there has been an issue around some not fully understanding what they have uh, signed up to in relation to community asset transfer. Uh, and I know in my own constituency uh, that if it hadn't been for the work of uh, the local council, uh, the asset transfer of Brasey and Police Station would not have seen uh, its uh, uh, fruition. It would have not seen uh, it being delivered and a project which I believe now will successfully move ahead and will be a great benefit to that community. McAleer for a supplement. Uh, um, based on the Minister's response, uh, is it fair to conclude that you feel it uh, is currently not fit for purpose? And what specific areas do you feel where it could be improved upon? I think that maybe a not fit for purpose might just be maybe too strong. However, I was concerned. Uh, I think the areas where we need to focus in around is uh, when you have organisations that have to have a capital receipt against uh, a particular asset that they have, and those organisations are facing particular financial challenges, then it, it ends up in a situation where the organisation focuses in upon the capital receipt as opposed to the community benefit. And that is where I think, uh, working with my colleagues uh, in the executive, working with other agencies, uh, that we will try to find a more acceptable way of 
delivering what I still believe is a valuable tool for government to have because there are many assets that can be transferred to communities that can make an invaluable contribution to those particular communities. Form the members that time is up.